Hello, and welcome to the Harvard Press Authors Off the Page podcast. My name is Chris Gondek, and today I'm off the page with Jay Taylor, the author of The Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek and the Struggle for Modern China. Jay Taylor is a research associate at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. His 2000 book, The Generalissimo Sun, Zhang Qingkao and the Revolutions in China and Taiwan, was also published by Harvard University Press. Jay Taylor, thanks so much for taking time to talk to Harvard University Press today. Uh, my pleasure. So could you give the listeners a brief description of Chiang Kai-shek at the height of his powers, like a physical description and, and how his manner was? Well, he was a taciturn man. Uh, he was uh, temperamental. He was introverted, uh, often uh, introspective. On the other hand, uh, he had certain romantic uh, qualities. He held his wife's hand in public, a very un-Chinese uh, thing to do. He picked flowers for her. He liked Tang poetry. He had a book of Tang poetry uh, put in his coffin, but uh, he forgot to put in uh, Sun Yat-sen's Three People's Principles. So uh, he was a strange uh, and complex man. Uh, he was a he was a sort of a medium height for a Chinese, probably five eight or something, uh, but very thin, very frail looking man, and he had a, a high pitched voice but a very heavy uh, Ningbo, Zhejiang uh, accent, which Chinese found difficult to understand. So let's go back to his youth. Um, how was China treated by the developed world during his youth? Uh, during his youth, well, of course, it was subject to humiliation beginning with the uh, Opium Wars in the, in the 1840s, when uh, Britain uh, particularly forced upon uh, China the, to accept the importation of opium brought in from uh, British ruled India. And that led to a whole series of unequal treaties, as they were called, in which, among other things, uh, this meant foreigners like Americans and British and Japanese. Uh, they could not be tried for crimes, even murder committed in China. They had to be tried by council officers from uh, their respective councils or embassies. So uh, it had been uh, also lost territories. Uh, the British grabbed uh, Hong Kong and uh, uh, Macau. I mean, the Portuguese had Macau long ago. And uh, Shanghai was divided up, most of Shanghai divided up uh, uh, into international concessions. The Germans took Shandong as their sphere of influence. And uh, eventually the Japanese uh, took Taiwan in 1895. So it had been a record of uh, shame and humiliation, which China seemed to be unable to to react to, like, like the Japanese. So how did this end up shaping his views on China? Well, he, he was a very strong uh, uh, patriot, a very strong nationalist. And then that turned uh, very soon, uh, when he was probably 18 years old, well, when he was 18 years old, into being an anti-Qing, a Republican uh, revolutionary uh, patriot uh, against the, the Manchu dynasty, which had been ruling China for over 200 years. These were people that used to be considered barbarians by the Chinese who captured China back in the, in the 1600s. So at that point, when he was 18 years old, he, he cut off his uh, pigtail, which all Chinese males had been required to, to wear uh, as a sign of sub subservience uh, to the Manchus. So uh, Zhang, like uh, every other Chinese, including Mao, who also cut off his queue or, or pigtail when he was 18, uh, they were highly nationalistic and uh, and felt this this deep need for for a total change in in China. Now, given the fact that he was a general during the conflict with the Japanese in the 1930s and 40s, I found it interesting that he was trained in the military in Japan. Uh, what was his relation before hostilities broke out? What was his relationship with Japan and Japanese culture? Well, he had, he had been uh, to school in Japan. He had gone to a preparatory academy uh, that was for, particularly set up for Chinese students to come who wanted to become military officers and have military training at a Japanese academy. So he had one year there, and then he spent uh, almost a year or more than half a year, as a, which was required as graduates of that school before actually going into the military academy in a Japanese military unit. In his case, it was uh, an artillery unit. So uh, he had a great uh, fondness for Japanese culture, and he admired greatly Japan's discipline and its uh, efficiency and, and how it had, of course, responded to 
to the West and beating, as we all know, uh, the Russian Empire in the Russo-Japanese War of 1902. So uh, when the war broke out, though, uh, he had already been, he had seen Japan for the previous 10 years as the major threat to China. And this sprang from uh, the Japanese view of Manchuria and, and North China, and, and, and indeed eventually all of China, as uh, sort of in their sphere of influence. Uh, and this had, this had excelled, accelerated during the First World War when the European powers were preoccupied. But uh, there was a particular bloody incident in Jinan as John was marching north with the revolution in 1928. And after that point, he kept calling, he wrote in his diaries, always referred to the Japanese as uh, dwarf pirates, which was a traditional Chinese pejorative. Uh, so he came to hate the Japanese uh, government and the Japanese uh, samurai system. Uh, so when the war broke out in 1937, he had been expecting it really for, for 10 years. So here in the early 21st century, there's quite a few people who may not have heard of Chiang Kai-shek. And the book, if nothing else, gives a real sense of how how impressive his achievement was in both unifying China and then successfully fighting a war against the Imperial Japanese Army. Can you give listeners a sense of the challenges he was facing really as he was leading up to the, a formal conflict with Japan? Well, uh, it was uh, the fact that China was a very backward country, had a very medieval uh, army compared to the Japanese uh, they were training, uh, Zhang started a training program using uh, the German army, which uh, China paid for, German advisors and trainers. And so by 1937, by the time the war started, uh, they had 300,000 German trained troops, and only 80,000, however, had German arms. So they had this elite force of 80,000. Uh, the problem was, and they had a few hundred aircraft, but they, they were old aircraft. The pilots had been trained by the Italians, not, not the Germans. So when the war started in 1937, uh, and Zhang had 80,000 elite forces, the Japanese soon, soon in all of China, would have a million elite forces. All of their forces were elite. Uh, the artillery, the firepower, the machine, you know, heavy machine guns, then the air power, they soon wiped out the Chinese army and the Chinese frigates. The, J the Japanese Navy and Air Force could go where they wanted. Uh, it took, John calculated it would take, every time they faced the, Chinese, the Japanese, they would have to have nine to one uh, uh, personnel advantage. The Chinese would have to in any hope of, of uh, victory. So uh, he faced this uh, almost impossible situation, but they fought on uh, against the Japanese for two years fought tooth and nail up the, up the Yangtze Valley. It took them a year and a half to, to capture, uh, almost a year and a half, to capture uh, Wuhan, uh, the last major big city up the, up the Yangtze. So then he fled up uh, to Qing, but still retained control over two-thirds of the Chinese population, three-quarters of the land, uh, for the next uh, six years fighting mostly uh, defensive wars against the Japanese. Once the Japanese are driven out, um, civil war started, and uh, his name has always been tied with uh, Mao Zedong. You, you know, you've now written the book, and you've had a chance to look back at both co the correspondents. In your opinion, who do you think understood one and each other better? Do you think Mao had a better understanding of Zhang, or Zhang had a better understanding of Mao? I think they understood each other quite well. Uh, each one had a pretty clear understanding of the other. Each one understood the other was uh, was a determined patriot and uh, nationalist, and uh, had the, the main feature being their perseverance, their determination, their steel <clears throat> steel will. Both of them uh, understood and appreciated that, and even respected that in the other. I think, but uh, one was, of course, uh, they had totally different uh, ideologies or political views. Zhang was uh, a modern uh, Confucian. Uh, in his early days, is really sort of a left con modern confusion. Whereas Zhang, uh, I mean Mao, was uh, very much a uh, full-blooded uh, modern uh, communist revolutionary who saw his loyalty to Moscow as being, and the Communist Party as being, uh, sort of key ingredient of being a, a revolutionary in China. But they they saw each other's different different character and temperament also. 
Zhang So, uh, I mean Mao So Zhang, as uh, a conscientious person, an earnestly conscientious person, a rather naively earnest uh, person who believed in his own, deeply in his own moral virtue. Uh, and Zhang, on the other hand, understood Mao, felt Mao to be a, this, a determined man, uh, but uh, a man, uh, he believed, that, that had rejected this idea of moral force, that it was everything came from the political requirements, that he was, he was thus a very cynical man, whereas Zhang saw himself as a very sincere person. And thus, Zhang Mao himself saw, at that time said, this, this did give an advantage. Uh, this gave opportunity, anyway, <laughs> to the communists. Well, Zhang was also the father of modern Taiwan, and he got to sit there and see quite a bit of how the Cold War developed in Asia. Um, what was Zhang's opinion of Nixon's rapprochement with uh, Mao in 1972? Well, he thought it was uh, an incredible uh, a betrayal of uh, their commitment to Taiwan. He had, uh, it seems uh, quite evident, although it's not 100% certain, but it seems uh, overwhelmingly evident to me that Zhou Enlai had been briefing uh, Chiang Kai-shek early on about the contacts between Washington via Pakistan uh, and uh, Romania about uh, moving towards a, a detente. It stood to reason that Zhou Enlai had, re- had, had objectives in doing this. Uh, and I think the evidence is pretty clear. And Zhang, whereas he, he had always lectured the American and sometimes would, would threaten that Taiwan would collapse if they moved towards any sort of uh, rapprochement or even improved relations with, with China, when Zhou informed him at this stage, probably in late 1969, of what Nixon was doing, Zhang realized uh, that he really had no, no option at trying to oppose uh, the Nixon and trying to throw a, a fit and threaten collapse or even defection uh, if this went ahead, that this would not work. And his main task then was try to minimize the impact on Taiwan and prevent this drastic, rather dramatic act of the United States cutting off its ties, official ties to Taiwan try to minimize the effect on Taiwan's uh, economy and its financial structure and its investment on foreign investment. And he remained uh, quite quite calm about it, but, but all the time uh, hating Nixon for it. So finally, many people have said the 21st century is going to be the century of China. Uh, what do you think Zhang would have thought about the current economic and political status in the People's Republic? Well, I think if he came back today, he would see... Uh, Hu Jintao also as, as a modern uh, Confucianist, although uh, a more leftist one than, uh, than he was, ever had been, but still a modern uh, Confucianist who had uh, essentially moved China away from the, the basic heart of, of communism under Mao, the class struggle, uh, the idea of a propertyless uh, society, the idea of world revolution, that Hu, Hu Jintao and his colleagues, he would see, have replaced uh, all of these uh, tenets of communism have replaced them with uh, Confucianism and the glories of Chinese culture and history as the very core, the moral and ethical core of Chinese society today. Thus, uh, I would say, in the book uh, concludes with the thought that uh, the vision that drives modern China today is that of Chiang Kai-shek, not Mao Zedong. Do you think that he would rec- if he were alive today? You think he would recommend reunification of China, uh, Taiwan, and China? I think he would approve uh, the, what is doing, what is happening today, uh, with a new Kuomintang president. Uh, quite surprisingly, uh, Taiwan has re-elected a uh, Kuomintang president after eight years of having a pro-independence uh, government, and so the present government. Uh, pursues a line that uh, Zhang Sun, Zhang Jingwu, had begun uh, back in the mid-1980s. And that is one of gradual uh, improvement of relations, gradual building up uh, economic and cultural ties, uh, and having political discussions uh, all around the basis on, uh, on the concept, 
centered around the fundamental concept that there is one, one China, that is in that Taiwan is part of it, and mainland China is part of it, and Hong Kong is part of it. Uh, but that uh, how this is to be manifest, uh, that that will be worked out in the in the future, and that the position of President Ma Ying Jiao today is is like that of Zhang Jingwu that there should be eventually reunification, but it could never happen without uh, the approval of the Taiwan people. It should never happen, and thus uh, democratization is the key. That only when China becomes democratic uh, will real unification be possible. But in the meantime, not to threaten uh, and disturb matters by asserting Taiwan's independence or intention to move ever in, in that direction, but instead to re keep reaffirming the basic principle of one China. So Zhang would, Zhang would approve that. Jay Taylor, the author of The Generalissimo, John Kai shek and The Struggle for Modern China. Thanks for talking to Harvard University Press today. Thank you, Chris. And that was Jay Taylor talking about his book, The Generalissimo, John Kai shek and The Struggle for Modern China. For more information about this and other titles, please visit our website at www.hup.harvard.edu. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Authors Off the Page podcast. Copyright 2009, Harvard University Press. All rights reserved. Thank you.